pleased today to be spending some time with Ray Suarez, whom many of you know. Ray Suarez is the senior correspondent for the News Hour with Jim Lehrer. He came to that position from National Public Radio's uh, Talk of the Nation, and he's here in Grand Rapids on this occasion for the 14th uh, annual Diversity Lecture Series. So I want to speak particularly about your most recent book, The Holy Vote, the Politics of Faith in America. And it's kind of, if people aren't familiar with that book, um, can you briefly lay out your, your premise in the book and, and why you felt compelled to, to write that book, which was published in 2006, I believe? I was watching the way politics were being done in the country. And from my perch in Washington, uh, I could see the way religious-flavored appeals and religious organizations were becoming entwined with our national politics. And I was curious as to whether this had always been the case, whether it was different now, whether religion had been involved in our politics, but just in different pre-technological ways in the 19th century. So I said, well, I've really got to write about this. And um, I got a publisher to agree with that premise and, uh, and got to writing and got to researching and uh, went all, all the way back to the earliest days of the United States and looked at when religion was present and when it wasn't and how it's used today in campaigns, mm -hmm. in political appeals, and to put together large coalitions of people to be for and against things. Mm. That's how we do politics when it comes to anything, mm -hmm. but this was a new overlay onto the way we do our politics. Mm. Well, it is my sense that God Talk has been used by politicians, presidential politicians, for many, many years. I mean, Lincoln, Roosevelt, even up to Jimmy Carter, is, is there a difference, you think, in terms of, am I correct in that, for one? And two, is there a difference between how presidential God speak was used by them and how it's been used in the last, what, eight, ten years? I think there is a difference. There's a quantitative difference and a qualitative difference. Mm -hmm. In the late 19th century and into the 20th century, presidents and aspiring presidents used God Talk really um, at times of great national peril mm -hmm. and used it very sparingly. It wasn't uh, such a feature of the way we think and talk about politicians that we would know that much about their faith life, what denomination they belonged to, how often they went to church, um, bits and snatches of Corinthians and old Methodist hymns weren't mm -hmm. sprinkled into State of the Union addresses and, and things like that. Yes. Um, Dwight Eisenhower uh, referred to God in his address to the troops on the eve of the Normandy invasion. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, during his Christmas address uh, to the nation during the Second World War, would talk about um, God's will, and certainly Abraham Lincoln, when the United States was uh, on the verge of breaking to pieces and having its whole future changed, uh, did. But in the main... Uh, our politicians didn't do it that much and picked their spots uh, much more judiciously. And frankly, uh, I think a lot of modern presidents, until uh, we got to Jimmy Carter, who opened a new era, mm -hmm. um, their faith lives were kind of a mystery to us. Very few people could tell you what church Dwight Eisenhower belonged to, for instance, or uh, well, obviously, John Kennedy is an exception since that was a, a, a milestone of, of electing the first Roman Catholic uh, to the Oval Office. But uh, Lyndon Johnson, who also, uh, in some of his momentous uh, speeches, trying to build national will behind the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. um, people weren't aware that he was a member of the Disciples of Christ. And if they were, they didn't know very much about the nature of his involvement. Mm -hmm. uh, yet very much a part of George W. Bush's appeal to the country and his biography that became um, the boilerplate for a lot of political reporters' stories about his life uh, was his faith journey and his adult conversion and, uh, and getting off alcohol. And, you know, 
it is now different from what it was when um, people probably knew vaguely that Harry Truman was a Baptist, but not much more than that. Mm -hmm. So clearly this didn't begin with with, uh, President Bush, second President Bush. Where did the main shift take place? Was it was it with Carter? Whether when did and, and I think we're particularly talking about it's not a good way to speak of it, but um, conservative evangelical uh, church groups and individuals uh, and, and new groups that formed in relation to being involved with politics. When did this really shift and become and build into such a factor that it was in the last certainly two elections at least? I think you'd have to go back to uh, the Civil Rights Acts of the Mm mid-60s when, as he was signing them, Lyndon Johnson predicted that he had lost the South for the Democratic Party for a generation. At that point, uh, in the great battle of wills in the United States, in the great social struggle that culminated in those landmark pieces of legislation, the whites of the South felt that they had lost that there had been a battle, Mm. been a confrontation, even troops were deployed on the streets of American cities, and they had lost. Their way of life had lost, their worldview had lost, so they retreated to the sidelines of American politics. Mm -hmm. It was no longer okay to stand up in the United States Senate or the House of Representatives and say that you were a segregationist and this was a part of God's plan for humankind. And... Jimmy Carter took one way, took one path toward bringing evangelicals in the South off the sidelines and back into the arena. And the Republican Party took another path with Richard Nixon and the Southern strategy Mm -hmm. trying to uh, take generations of Southern whites who had been faithful voters in the Democratic Party and bring them now into a new Republican coalition. Mm -hmm. The country was changing. People were moving out of the cities of the Northeast and the Midwest to the South, to West, to the Sun Belt. And so there were demographic changes, there were legal changes, and there were political changes that all sort of converge by the mid-70s in the candidacy of Jimmy Carter, who spoke openly and frequently and without uh, hesitation or, uh, or inhibition mm. about the role that faith played in his life and uh, his life as a Sunday school teacher and, and so on. This was something new. Mm-hmm. Uh, you really have to go back to Williams Jennings, William Jennings Bryan at the turn of the previous century right. to find a candidate who spoke as much about religion, certainly a Democratic nominee, uh, to, as Jimmy Carter did. And Southern whites did come off the sidelines. They made Jimmy Carter president. He was the first Democrat to carry, uh, the last Democrat to carry some of those Mm -hmm. states in the Deep South. But by the end of Carter's term, those same voters felt betrayed by him, uh, felt that uh, they had helped make him president, but he hadn't done much for them. And And, and and they were ripe for an appeal from the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. And Ronald Reagan came in and with uh, open use of religious imagery, uh, reference to his own background and his mother's uh, teaching of the faith in their household, uh, a lot of homey stories Mm -hmm. about uh, about Mm -hmm. growing up in the church, uh, made a very direct appeal to um, now a very upset and uh, betrayed feeling uh, white southern evangelicals who uh, then trooped into the polls in November 1980 made Ronald Reagan president, and um, really set the Republican Party on a road uh, toward an ever-tightening alliance uh, with uh, the conservative Christian churches. Mm-hmm. I want to get to that to that alliance, that, that, that ever-tightening alliance, and, and is that the case at this point? But I want to back up for a minute. What, what was it that, that they didn't get in Jimmy Carter? He used the religious language. He's clearly a, a person of deep faith, of evangelical faith, though certainly he is now chagrined by what, how this has all turned. Um, what, what was it that they didn't get from, from Carter? Was it, was, was it what, policy issues? It was policy issues. Um, Roe v. Wade had been decided a few years before that, but that wasn't the main thing. There had been a Supreme Court decision denying tax-exempt status to segregated uh, Christian schools in the South. 
And that was one of the uh, germinating moments Mm. for what became the Christian right. Yes, eventually the issue of abortion uh, was used as a catalyst to help galvanize this movement. But before that, it was, uh, well, not just that, a couple of things. The series of Supreme Court decisions in the early 60s that took scripture reading and organized prayer out of the public schools, Mm -hmm. uh, followed by the Civil Rights Acts, followed by, um, finally, uh, Brown v. Board in uh, the mid-50s, really finally taking root in the states of the Old South. So after much delay, these school systems were forced to integrate, and the so-called Christian academies that rose in response to that desegregation uh, were denied tax-exempt status by a Supreme Court decision. And that became one of the lightning bolt movements uh, for that religious political movement because a lot of evangelical leaders realized that they needed more input into the political system in order to have their voice heard, their worldview understood, and uh, to make more decisions like that one impossible. So even though he was an evangelical Christian, Jimmy Carter wasn't looking out for their interests, their, their worldview, and what uh, they thought should be happening in the, in the nation. Well, uh, he didn't uh, rail against Roe versus Wade. He didn't try to restore um, the government support for mm-hmm. uh, these essentially segregated schools mm-hmm. and uh, really proved to their satisfaction over the four years of his presidency that he wasn't their kind of guy. Yeah. And Ronald Reagan picked up all those states sure. the next time. Okay. So an ever-tightening relationship between the Republican Party and that segment and those organizations. So has that continued to, to tighten? Is it is it continuing to grow? How much will it be a factor in in this election? Was it a factor in in 2004 and the same factor in 2006 midterms? A couple of other things happened that we also have to keep in mind. Because all it, you know, it would be lovely if this was sort of a um, a single swinging pendulum and we could identify its path and its uh, the speed that it was moving at and say yes, this is it. But a lot of things were feeding into these possibilities. Um, it became so cheap to put yourself on national television, Mm -hmm. that roughly the same fixed costs involved in putting your Sunday morning worship services on your local television on Sunday morning, for roughly the same amount of money, you could be on TV and cable systems all over the country. Mm -hmm. So satellite television and the wide penetration of cable television helped make these ministries national ministries. The um, invention of the personal computer and increasingly powerful memory made it possible to manage and sort ever larger mailing lists, databases that allowed you to identify and target with both political and religious marketing uh, the kind of direct mailing and fundraising appeals Mm -hmm. that fueled both the churches and these new political movements. So a man like Richard Vigory becomes a power broker in the Republican Party through his early understanding of these technologies and the way they could be used to benefit um, politicians looking for a closer link with the church. Mm -hmm. So all these things are happening at once. If you go to uh, the Crystal Cathedral and you're a prominent politician, Pastor Schuller will recognize you there in the uh, in the pews, and you'll stand up, maybe say a few words, and suddenly you're on TV all over the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a very important thing, and the Joel Austins and the T.D. Jakeses and the Benny Hins and on and on and on become household names because this is no longer a very a dauntingly expensive right. thing to do, hmm. and. Um, Also, there's an increasing growth away from the traditional denominations, away from mainline Christianity. So fewer uh, 
Americans, both in real numbers and as a percentage of the faithful all told, are members of the mainline denominations, um, members even of the largest evangelical denominations, as some of these new super churches right. are non-denominational. Mm-hmm. And it's really the uh, charisma of an individual pastor or a builder of a ministry that becomes the guiding force. This makes it easier to marry up with the Republican Party because you don't answer to a hierarchy, a church headquarters in another part of the country, Mm -hmm. a group of elders or a presbytery that you have to explain your actions Mm -hmm. to. You decide, yeah, I'm going to have Senator so-and-so come to the church, and you're the only person you have to ask. I'm I'm sure you've got a boss, right? (laughs) Yes, though in in my denomination, not quite as tightly, but the whole congregation is my boss. boss, Right, exactly. Indeed. So... So has the has the separation between church and state completely broken down? Uh, there's a group of clergy uh, who are openly defying the the ban on uh, endorsing a, a specific political candidate. Um, is that is that wall there? Does it have huge holes in it? it? Will it be resurrected, or what do you think is going to happen from here? I think some of it is going to have to do with who the next Attorney General of the United Mm -hmm. States is. Uh, You know, four years ago, the pastor emeritus, that is the retired rector of All Saints Episcopal Church in Pasadena, California, um, got up and preached a sermon when, during a summer uh, worship service when he was just a guest preacher because he was the now retired uh, rector of that congregation. And he spoke in a very pointed and uh, very uncomplimentary way Mm -hmm. about the prosecution of the war in Iraq and whether it was a just and moral war. And investigators from the Internal Revenue Service uh, sent documents and sent investigators. They requested a tape of the sermon, the text Mm -hmm. of the sermon, and they opened a dossier, launched an investigation into the preaching at All Saints Episcopal Church in Pasadena. I interviewed the rector for my book, and he said that he developed a national network of the strangest bedfellows as he got support from evangelical preachers around the country, uh, in many cases hardcore conservatives, who had no particular love for the message that was being preached from the pulpit at All Saints, Mm -hmm. but also were chafing against the restrictions of uh, against political messages being delivered from the pulpit Mm -hmm. and hoped that All Saints prevailed so that they themselves would be able to pursue a a more open relationship Mm -hmm. with political candidates Mm -hmm. uh, in their neck of the woods, in Oklahoma and Tennessee and and elsewhere. Um, I got to tell you, at that moment... I wasn't quite sure how I felt about Mm -hmm. all of that. Uh, You know, preaching about war and peace is a tradition as old as the church itself. And asking pointed and sometimes difficult questions about where a believer's alliance is with the state that prosecutes war in all of our names or with the church that is a supranational body, Mm -hmm. uh, the company of all believers that that knows no passports and flags and currency. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, gee, if if a government investigator is suddenly snooping around your church because you were preaching against war, where are we getting to? Mm -hmm. Um, But on the other hand, do I want, uh, as a church-going person, do I want to have uh, politics preached from the pulpit uh, without fear and and pastors just letting it fly Mm -hmm. in churches from coast to coast every week uh, without uh, putting their tax-exempt status in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. What are we about here? The Constitution never gets to the point where it it lands decidedly in one spot and says, this is allowed and this is not allowed. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we take that raw material of the Constitution and try to read meanings into it because it's silent. Mm -hmm. You know, the IRS wasn't even anticipated by the framers. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, there are holes in the wall of separation. There are uh, attempts to breach those walls. Mm -hmm. Right now there are sappers uh, working underneath it trying to undermine the foundations Mm -hmm. of it. 
because a lot of believers in the United States feel that that separation is no longer their friend. Mm -hmm. And in my book, I try to talk to those people not about how religion is a bad thing for government, but that we would we should really worry about religion and whether government is a good thing for it, whether government is a good partner uh, for the religious world. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's a very open question Indeed. and should be in this whole separation question um, doesn't get enough attention. We're all worried about religious influence on government. We should be more worried about government influence on religion. If it goes one way, it can go the other. One of the uh, leaders of, a, of an interfaith movement in Washington trying to preserve the separation between church and state uh, said to me, look, we are not going to speak fearlessly to government if we're compromised by it. We are not going to be tough on government when we need to be mm -hmm. if we're accepting Uncle Sam's dollar uh, and in the way that money is fungible inside congregations, accepting money from the government to do one thing, which frees us to use our other money Zero. in other ways. Exactly. Uh, and so I hope people read the holy vote wherever they feel that they fall on the religious spectrum and sort of do battle with the ideas I throw up there because uh, I don't try to make up your mind for you as much as suggest what's hard about this. Mm. That's really my mission, mm -hmm. I think. So what then, <clears throat> what then is the, the appropriate role or the, or the most helpful to both religion and and politics. Uh, you, you make the point in the book that it's, it's not if religion belongs in politics, but but rather, when does it play an informative role? When does it reflect distilled public uh, opinion about an issue? Are there examples of, of when the church has, has done that um, and examples of when it's been in there and certainly not sought to or certainly not done that? Well, there are um, cases on all sides of the political spectrum. Uh, if we had been having a conversation about religion and politics in 1968, um, it might have been a very different conversation because at that time, just that phrase evoked liberal interference in the affairs of government, whether it was uh, working to stop the Vietnam War, uh, working to denuclearize the American military, uh, whether it was... Um, uh, working to end Jim Crow in the South. These were all perceived as liberal causes that were taken up by the Roman Catholic Church uh, and by the mainline Protestant denominations. Um, so this, this, we should remember that when religious voices have gotten involved in trying to move the government in a new direction, it wasn't always uh, conservatives sure. and it wasn't always uh, on the, uh, the the right end of the of the spectrum. More recently, you've uh, certainly had organized religious voices, uh, for instance, um, trying to get abstinence-only education to be made a part of the uh, school curricula nationwide. And indeed, uh, during the Bush administration. Um, Materials that were prepared for school-aged children around the country uh, did not uh, teach very much about how to protect yourself or how to protect others or uh, about a dawning or developing adolescent sexual ethic mm -hmm. as much as it just said don't. You know what the best advice is? Don't. And... That was one group of Americans' take on that issue, and I understand it, and as the father of three children, I understand it very well, uh, but I don't think that was experts' best advice, and in fact, it's been demonstrated since abstinence-only exactly. curricula were introduced around the country that it basically doesn't work, exactly. and that uh, the alums of the abstinence-only curriculum have sex earlier and more often than people who are taught sex ed. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. All right, I don't, I don't take any particular delight in that. I, I mourn for the children who Indeed. weren't protected by their government when they could have been. I want, uh, one very interesting case had to do with the approval of Plan B, emergency contraception for people who were afraid that either they were unprotected or uh, the protection failed, and they wanted to take a backup form of contraception in order to prevent uh, pregnancy. This was a fascinating battle uh, because the medical side of the approval process through the Food and Drug Administration waved Plan B through and said, yes, this works. We know it works. There is some harm, but it's tiny and marginal, just like all drugs Mm -hmm. that now have to be honest about what their side effects are. And so, yes, we approve, say the docs. But then the advisory commission that, uh, that also is part of the FDA process that now had many Bush appointees that were pushed by the National Association of Evangelicals and others onto that board uh, bottled up Plan B for years. And the leader of that one whom they, who was tried to be appointed, who was appointed and not approved to be, to be the head of it, as I understand. Right. Yeah. And they, they held it up for years, and really this was on strictly emotional, um, strictly religious grounds, mm-hmm. as it turns out. Mm-hmm. Now, as a religious person, I'm not sure I want religion totally kept out of the conversation, but I'm also not that sure I want it involved in the decisions of the Food and Drug Administration as to the efficacy and safe use of a drug. Um, their maintenance was that, uh, that people would have more sex and more irresponsible sex if Plan B was available. Based on an ideology rather than any shred right. of they, research. They brought no research sure. to the table. Mm-hmm. And again, if they had brought research to the table, they said, look, we have concerns about this. We don't want people having irresponsible sex. We don't want people having sex without love. This is our point of view on how this is going. And you know, it also doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. For, I'm for, there for that argument. Exactly. That's a good argument to have. Exactly. Uh, what I was... Uh, interested by, provoked by, uh, was using religion in this way in places where it sort of turned up unexpectedly Mm -hmm. uh, in in the government, in the deliberations and operation of the government. Mm -hmm. Our time is getting short. A few other questions I want to get, but I particularly want to get this one. And you followed politics uh, for a long time, immersed in it, uh, written two books and written this, this most recent book. It was very well researched and, and, and in-depth and well-written book. Um, what is you, as you've been so immersed in this and see things happening now, uh, of what you see going on now, what brings you uh, the most despair or concern and what brings you the most hope? I watched the Democrats who had looked at the exit polling, had looked at the critical comment, had looked at the, uh, the results of the last several national elections, and I thought to myself, hmm, they can either figure out that they can do this and still hold on to who they are and hold on to themselves, or they can try to ape the Republicans Mm -hmm. and try to do a Democratic version of talking God talk. And um, I think that's still a work in progress. Uh, We've seen Tim Kaine Mm -hmm. uh, run, a Roman Catholic, uh, run in Virginia, which has not been uh, particularly welcoming territory for Roman Catholic politicians historically. Especially if they're against the death penalty. Especially if they're against the death penalty. And I watched Tim Kaine figure out as he went along in his candidacy uh, to go from being the mayor of Richmond uh, to being the uh, governor of the state, when it was involved, when it wasn't involved, when it was right, when it was wrong. He told me during our interview um, that some zealous members of his staff, thinking that they were on to a good thing, had a box of bumper stickers printed (laughs) that said, Christians for Cain. And he said, if I ever see that on an automobile, you are fired mm. because it had a cross on it oh, and it said oh. Christians for Cain. Mm. And he didn't want to do it that way. Mm-hmm. He thought it was a, 
a part of who he was. It was a part of what made him who he was. He talked about his time as a missionary in South America right. and how that shaped his desire for public service. And then he had to walk the minefield of capital punishment, as you mentioned. Virginia is a very pro-capital punishment mm -hmm. state. Capital punishment is on the books and in operation in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And he had to explain to the citizens of Virginia that he thought capital punishment was wrong. But if some was, someone was convicted of a capital crime, fully conforming to the laws of the state, and that was the decision of a jury and a judge, he was going to sign that death warrant, even though he would prefer that human hearts would turn in another direction mm. and that the people of Virginia would someday reject capital punishment. And he has signed death warrants. His Republican opponent, who had been strongly supported mm -hmm. by the uh, evangelical Christian movement in Virginia. He was the attorney general? The former attorney general, mm -hmm. Mr. Gilmore, said that, no, 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 no. If you elect this guy, he's going to use subterfuge, underhandedness. He's always going to find some flaw in the legal reasoning or some uh, sort of T that wasn't crossed or I that wasn't dotted and not sign these death warrants. And Tim Kaine prevailed. He proved that a Democrat could talk about religion and win. Mm -hmm. He talked about um, sticking to his guns, but not exactly sticking to his guns on capital punishment. Yes, he still talks against it and mm -hmm. wishes it wasn't on the law books mm -hmm. in Virginia, but there it is, and he respects that. And so that's one model. And then there are uh, Democratic politicians who are trying to shoehorn it into their conversations and make ham-fisted biblical allusions and misquote scripture. And I, I just want to clap my hands over my ears and run into the next room uh, when I hear that, when Howard Dean says the book of Job is his favorite book in the New Testament and, uh, and so on. I just think, oh, you know, don't, don't even go there. Just, just you know, punt, answer another question, do something. It's better to not say that. Indeed. And, uh, and, Especially if you put Job in the New Testament. Yeah, that's right. So um, there are, I, I watch with interest as the Democrats um, choose between finding a way to talk honestly about this in a way that doesn't sound forced and canned and pandering and and lame. Mm -hmm. And um, I watch as the Republicans now repent at leisure. Uh, there are churches that are openly breaking with political the political world and saying, this was a mistake, we shouldn't have done this. Mm -hmm. uh, Republican leaders saying, you know, um, now that uh, our brand is wrecked and their brand is wrecked, uh, maybe we ought to rethink this. Uh, one church in Washington, D.C. had a vote of its congregants. It's an American Baptist church, okay. not a Southern Baptist right. church, mm -hmm. but it was called uh, Washington Baptist Temple. And they voted to take Baptist out of the name uh, and take on a whole new name mm. because the association with the Southern Baptists was hurting their roles. People wouldn't come to, when they moved into the area, they wouldn't come there to go to church uh. Uh, because uh, they, were, they felt that they were a welcoming community, but that in that part of Washington, D.C., it was uh, hurting their evangelism mm. and hurting their outreach. So... The dust hasn't settled. Indeed. Um, there are a lot of mistakes still to be made. Um, and there are a, a lot of um, people, I think, who are going to find the, what feels right to them and what comports with American tradition and our Constitution. Mm. We're still groping our way there as a people, and I think we will get there. This may be looked back on someday as a 40-year experiment that saw a little overreaching and a little, um, a little too chummy relationship between um, pulpit and legislative chamber. Uh, and both sides are going to have to figure out how to have that relationship in a way that does respect our traditions, our deepest traditions, and our laws. Yeah. 
Thank you very much oh, for, my for speaking with me. The book, The Holy Vote, uh, I would certainly commend it to, to everyone as a clergy, uh, very concerned about uh, social justice issues and involved with, uh, with not partisan politics, but certainly with uh, a number of issues that are involved with uh, policy making and so forth. Uh, it's, it's certainly a very important uh, book, and, and I think you've... Uh, You've, you've nailed it in terms of uh, the, the, the issue and the importance on the, on the political scene. And Thank you very fascinating much. Fascinating to see how this is going to also play out in the current election. I can't wait to see it. Uh, yes, me neither. Thank you. Thanks.